a certain man who was reflective on matters of public life uh, a long time ago said this, honor est premium virtutis. Honor is the reward of virtue. His name was Cicero. And I think we're bound to admit that uh, this admirable precept is, uh, is not invariably warranted either in academic or in public life. In some cases, we, we, we wonder if that is not too enthusiastic a judgment. But this is not one of those occasions. Cicero's maxim fully pertains to our speaker this evening. Jean Bethke Elstein has been much and widely honored on account of real and evident virtues both in her public and in her personal life. This remarkable woman, mother of five children, is regularly named as one of America's foremost public intellectuals. She is a dedicated professor, the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Professor of Social and Political Ethics in the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. She has there also appointments in political science and the Committee on International Relations. And she is the holder of the Levy Chair in the Foundations of American Freedom at Georgetown University simultaneously. She is very widely acclaimed as a scholar. Her books include Public Man, Private Woman, Woman in Social and Political Thought, Meditations on Modern Political Thought, Woman and War, Democracy on Trial, Real Politics at the Center of Everyday Life, Augustine and the Limits of Politics, who Are We? Critical Reflections, Hopeful Possibilities, Jane Addams and the Dream of American Democracy, Just War Against Terror, The Burden of American Power in a Violent World, and most recently, Sovereignty, God, State, and Self, her Gifford Lectures published last year, uh, given in 2006. Jean Bethke Elstein is a distinguished contributor to national intellectual culture. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a Guggenheim Fellow, a fellow at the Bellagio Center of the Rockefeller Foundation. She is holder of the McGuire Chair in Ethics at the Library of Congress, and she is a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, where she also serves on the Board of Trustees of that organization. She's been a Phi Beta Kappa lecturer. And in 2002, she received the Goodnow Award, the highest award bestowed by the American Political Science Association for distinguished service to the profession. She has served on the board of the National Humanities Center as a member of the Council of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Scholars Council of the Library of Congress, and the board of the National Endowment for Democracy. In 2008, she was appointed to the President's Council on Bioethics. In 2006, she delivered those prestigious Gifford Lectures at Edinburgh. In all of this, I want to say she merits honor from all those of us who aim to pursue virtues of the intellectual life, not merely for personal success, but for the sake of the common good. We should admire her for her consistency and for her tenacity. Her characteristic civil counsel is admonitory and she is no respecter of persons in giving it. Her characteristic civic counsel is therefore good for us. It's directed to the health of democracy and defense against democracy's subtler enemies. What she has shown is that often we are our own worst enemies. We claim democratic freedom, yet too often mean by the term merely individualistic license. Jean Elstein's work in political history shows that a cumulative effort of overemphasis on individual rights, along with a widespread rejection of public responsibilities, has brought upon us in invasive, demeaning, and condescending government policies. A major component of this problem, Elstein has suggested, is a voyeuristic tendency to reject the classical distinction between our lives as public citizens and our lives as private persons. Legitimate social authority, she has suggested, is undermined by our individualistic appetites. In a time in our culture in which the triumph of the subjective more and more obliterates this critical boundary, Elshane has argued persuasively that individual rights exist only when the social self is developed, that is, 
both nurtured and corrected through the influence of surrounding communities in a covenant, covenanted acceptance of responsibilities which are mutual. I think you will appreciate that her subject for us this evening will advance the trajectory of her dominant thesis in this regard. Genetic fundamentalism and the myth of the sovereign self. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming to the podium Jean Bethke Elstein. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm left almost speechless, not quite, um, by, that, uh, by that introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be back here. I was here in 2004 and enjoyed myself thoroughly, uh, so I'm happy to be back. And I want to begin by thanking uh, Darren Davis and Vicki Schultz um, for their organization of this event, their impeccable attention to detail. I also want to thank Heather, who's been driving me around and has been very patient with my um, slightly uneven schedule, so I appreciate uh, the help and the assistance. Um, <clears throat> a few years ago, I gave a lecture, it's probably 15 now, um, at Princeton, and um, it was a, a period when there was a big debate about civil society. Uh, Robert Putnam from Harvard had written his book on bowling alone. Um, I'd published a book called Democracy on Trial. So this debate was very much in the air. <clears throat> One of the people in attendance that evening was uh, my good friend, uh, the distinguished uh, late anthropologist Clifford Gertz. And when I finished, um, I was chatting to some people, and he came up, and um, I greeted him and said, well, Cliff, um, this was something of a civic sermon, I think. And he said, that's OK. I thought it was a pretty good one. Um, so tonight, I'm afraid I'll be a little sermonic, um, and you can be the judge of whether it's a good one or not. That's up to you. <clears throat> Well, in my most recent book, as you already heard in the generous introduction, a book called Sovereignty, colon, God, State, and Self, um, I offer a sustained examination and critique and interpretation of competing understandings of the sovereignty of God's state, God, states, and selves. Now, I want to give you very briefly, <clears throat> and this has to be done briefly, a uh, sense of the architecture of the book. Um, the first part is spent looking at different construals of God's sovereignty um, and a shift that happens in the late Middle Ages from a dominant understanding of God as the, the, the very... Uh, ultimate, the, the apogee of, of reason and love, as the site of reason and love. God created natural laws that reflect that reason, and human beings can come to discern these truths. So a shift, not a complete abandonment, but a shift in emphasis, and certainly a, um, a rich contestation between a notion of God as to be thought of primarily as the site of of sovereign will, of power that can even be capricious and arbitrary, so that God might, if he wants, overturn those laws of nature and even step back in history and undo something that had happened. Uh, this is associated with a turn in philosophy called nominalism, and you have this struggle uh, with these two sort of understandings of God's sovereignty. And that struggle continues. That struggle goes on over time. And indeed, if I'm right, uh, this struggle sort of migrates into uh, politics and into political life, early modern understandings of political life. And you find it reflected in views of the state and in views of rulership in general. Uh, one view of rulership is that it needs to embody certain understandings of reason, and that the king, the ruler, is under the law, not outside of it. Uh, this is the view that comes through the Thomistic tradition of, again, God as reason and love, and is reflected, for example, in a somewhat attenuated way, but reflected nonetheless, in John Locke's classic work, uh, Second Treatise, that was so important to the American founders, in which Locke makes the ruler a party to 
the social contract, and he or she, he, the ruler, is obligated by it, is obliged to it, is not outside the terms of that contract. Earlier, before Locke wrote his classic, Thomas Hobbes wrote his Leviathan, which is a thoroughgoing uh, nominalist argument, an argument that, in fact, uh, human beings are at base um, creatures who are a danger one to the other, um, who are not intrinsically social, who have no social forms of any kind prior to the coming of this contract that sort of forges them into an entity, but then the Leviathan, our ruler, is outside the terms of the contract, is not bound by those terms. So you have a notion, in other words, of bound and unbound power uh, that begins to contest, and that contestation continues. Now, <clears throat> how do you get to the sovereign self? Well, in, in visually, I imagined the sort of strong sovereign self as a sort of image of a sovereign state, the strong sovereign state, sort of parceled up into little mini states, and each of us, in a sense, is one of those little entities. Uh, because the strong sovereign self um, is, is construed as a law unto himself, not bound by any higher ordering law. The quest of such a self is for full mastery and full self-control. Uh, this view of the self is one that is highly individualistic on the level of being itself. That's just the way we are. And all relationships that we enter into are entirely volitional. Otherwise, no one else has a claim on me. Uh, any notion of dependency or interdependency is, uh, is shunned. The strong sovereign self is wary of those sorts of possible obligations and relationships. Um, we are not, in other, in other words, human beings all the way down to sovereign selves, quite the opposite. And there is a tendency to sort of divinize human will and human choice in views of the strong sovereign self. Now, these issues, it seems to me, are so critical because over time, or so I hope to display, the notion of the sovereign self threatens to undermine the dignity of the human person. Now, how so? Well, the answer, I think, lies in the fact that in making an idol of the self alone, we sometimes subtly and sometimes egregiously assault the sort of delicate tendrils of relationship that lift up and that display our humanity. Now, <clears throat> if we are not fully masters in our own house, what then are we? If we are not perfectly autonomous, sort of self-naming, giving the law to ourselves, are we autonomous in any way? What sort of achievement might some notion of chastened or bound autonomy be? If radical limitless freedom driven by will is a destructive dead end, then what does freedom with limits offer us? What limits? How do we understand those? Now, the great uh, 20th century writer, uh, Albert Camus, seems to me entirely right when he says, one who claims everything and assumes absolute authority lays claim to nothing short, these are his words now, of total freedom and the unlimited display of human pride. Nihilism confounds creator and created in the same blind fury. Suppressing every principle of hope, it rejects the idea of any limit. That's the end of the quote from Camus. And for him, this is the dark night of nihilism. His reference is to 20th century totalitarian ideologies, but I think his words apply to any notion of total freedom which means, of course, the freedom, as he reminds us, to kill without limits in order to attain one's own ends. So let me underscore certain salient points that I'm sure will seem obvious to you. Um, persons, as we know, are not born as mature members of society. 
Uh, they grow to become such until they reach maturity. There are good defensible reasons for treating them as beings in need of protection and guidance. But being a mature member of society does not entail complete independence from everybody else. Rather, it requires a willingness and an ability to build and to sustain relationships with other people, even again as one exercises a measure of, of moral autonomy. That is to say, the alternative to self-sovereignty is not complete submersion in some social whole such that one can't stand apart from it and evaluate it critically in some way. So the alternatives are not strong mastery or submersion. They're far more nuanced than that. Now, given the historic achievements of understandings of autonomy, as well as dangerous successes when you move the direction of the strong sovereign self and human beings be begin to decide that they're godlike, we obviously need, obviously need other sorts of selves to forestall the worst. Now, for what I will call the responsible self, the person before me sets a limit to my own projects. The responsible self acknowledges the one before him or her and lives in, if you will, the dialogic space thus created. We help to define one another. Camus reminds us that the will to dominate and the will to submit this sort of dialectic of mastery and slavery are part and parcel of the same triumph of the will and not the stuff out of which grows the responsible life. As well, the self cannot be what St. Augustine calls the proud self-same, a point of reference unto itself. Again, in strong versions of sovereignty, the self sort of shoulders on alone as the self is entirely volitional and grounds all reality, uh, whether in the form of the sort of self-maximizer of homo economicus, you know, the notion that what we are essentially is maximizers of our own utilities, or the biologically engineered perfect specimen of genetic scenarios, um, the notion that we can, in fact, what we are is our DNA, and we can, in fact, come to perfect that material and gain sort of perfect sovereign selves uh, out of a combination of modalities within which we experiment with and control that very stuff of life. There are other candidates for contemporary sovereign selves. Those are two uh, that I think are very present to us at the moment. One I call genetic fundamentalism, uh, on, on which I will not spend most of my time this evening, but it is an example of the strong sovereign self that I am discussing. Now, by contrast, the self I have in mind seeks meaning and dignity and finds a measure of both, not in total liberation from nature or total domination over nature, but rather in growing to become a person according to our human natures. And because that nature is intrinsically social, we must refrain from doing everything of which we are capable. If we refuse to observe a limit, we become destroyers. Now Camus describes the process of becoming a self as a much harder birth than one's first, over which of course one has no control at all. To be born as a child and then to be born in a harder child birth, he writes, consists of being born in relation to others. And that is a more difficult birth, in a way. It's one in which one is active in the process of becoming a self. Now, above all, we are created to love and to be loved, uh, to care for and to care. And as we say that, or as I say that, the thing that came to mind as I wrote was the human beings that we have um, in the past and perhaps in the present as well, downgraded. Uh, certainly in the benighted 20th century, we have all too many examples of that, of whole categories of persons that 
the National Socialist regime in Germany, uh, Stalinism, the Soviet Union aimed to destroy. Uh, they were persons of the wrong kind. Um, in Nazi Germany, this included persons with uh, mental disabilities, those and physical disabilities in some cases, those whose lives were unworthy of life in the language of the time, um, also the gentle language of idiots, imbeciles, and morons. What is a society to do with such persons? A society must rid itself of them because they undermine over time the possibility of generating a society of sovereign selves. What these selves have in common is the fact that they cannot be sovereign in the manner extolled and assumed by certain celebrations of self-mastery, you know, the Nazi version of the, of the Ubermensch. Now, we don't destroy in our society, and we didn't at the time, uh, large numbers of such persons, but they did represent a problem. We didn't gas people en masse, but certainly during the era leading up to uh, the Nazi era, in Western societies generally, including our own, uh, there was legislation that uh, permitted or even, in a sense, called for the involuntary sterilization of persons with disabilities. Uh, the Supreme Court affirmed that as constitutional and a notorious case called Buck v. Bell. Um, so we shouldn't take a whole lot of pride in the fact that we somehow escaped this tendency entirely. We did not. Um, that tendency, just to think of this as a kind of bracketed comment, uh, didn't go away, but it gave eugenics, you know, this attempt to, to, to breed uh, sort of good specimens, gave it a very bad name because it was associated with Nazism. So it's sort of creeping, it's creeping back in, but in a more anodyne form. You know, we talk euphemistically about it and talk about positive genetic enhancement or reinforcement or in some other ways but it is a kind of eugenics project. Now, we are, I think, in Western democracies at the moment, pursuing a paradoxical project. That is, we are more and more aware of those with physical and mental disabilities. We want to provide access for such persons. Yet at the same time, many of our most enthused about projects coming from the direction of, again, eugenics and biogenetic engineering, aim at creating a world with no such persons in it. So they're here and we'll give them access, but the world would be better if there weren't people like that in it. So we will, over time, genetically engineer them away. And until that time, we can eliminate some of them through, for example, selective abortion, which is the fate of 87% of Down syndrome pregnancies in the United States today. Um, and all of this with no apparent regard for how persons with disabilities might come to the conclusion, indeed many have, that so-called right to die statutes are a way to say right to eliminate non-sovereign selves and that this just might threaten them as well as the infirm and the elderly. When we read that there have been at least 200 cases of unauthorized euthanizing of spina bifida infants in the Netherlands, um, when the Netherlands Journal of Medicine itself, through its official group of Dutch doctors, reports that 1,000 people a year are euthanized in the Netherlands with nothing remotely approaching consent, as if consent settles the problem, it doesn't, but still, that's supposed to be there and it isn't, then again, we have reason to worry. And in the Netherlands today, you have something called the Verhagen Protocols for the euthanizing of newborns born with handicaps. Um, and the doctor who, it's named after the doctor who came up with these protocols, and in an interview, Dr. Verhagen, um, Dr. Verhagen talked about how a sense of compassion drove him to want to institute this, and then he described his own reaction to the infants, the newborns he had euthanized, and he said, it's beautiful in a way, they are peaceful for the first time.
Now, where do we turn for alternatives to these and other prospects that are pushed by strong self-sovereignists? Well, one place to look, I suggest, if we're thinking about the cultural repertoire of Western culture and what resources are available to us, is certain moral narratives. Um, I speak of moral fables, um, those that warn us of hubristic overreach, of um, a curiosity turned deadly as it recognizes no limits and no constraints. Uh, a literary critic named Roger Shattuck writes concerning Mary Shelley, who is, as you know, the author of the famous story of Dr. Frankenstein. He writes her judgment of the presumptions and self-actions of Frankenstein in creating and then abandoning a new form of life, he tells us is very instructive, precisely because it warns us, again, about the notion that we bring, we, we are the masters who can bring life into being, and then if it doesn't suit our will, doesn't turn out to be what we want it to do, we can abandon it or destroy it. He goes on to say, <clears throat> apparently it required a woman to inventory the destruction caused by the quest for knowledge and glory carried to excess. Um, that may be overstated a bit uh, because we also have, um, for example, the story of Jekyll and Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, which suggests, again, that we experiment with our natures at our peril. And by experiment with our natures, I do not mean attempt an, any, attempt, any attempt to forestall terrible illnesses or healing injuries. Um, I mention this because there's always a reductionistic argument uh, put in place thrown in the face of us who call for limits, that it goes along these lines. It says, I see, well, because it means messing with our natures, I guess you would never have wanted pneumonia to be treated, or you would never have wanted a polio vaccine developed, which of course hits me pretty hard because I had polio as a child. But you can see how beside the point are such rejoinders. By assisting us in being whole in body and spirit, as whole as we can be given what was given us at birth, we help to complete our natures, not to alter them radically. Now, <clears throat> now one feature of celebrations of and arguments for self-sovereignty is this very strange abstractedness. I don't know what else to call it. It's a refusal to keep one's feet on terra firma, perhaps because that reminds us daily from dust to dust that we are earthy and earthbound creatures. We can only soar and achieve mastery if we are entirely disembodied. And this invites in turn a hyper-exaggerated notion of what can be achieved through various philosophical modalities. We create systems, we live in our heads, we expect selves and society to conform, and then we will have established the reign of sovereign reason and sovereign selves and sovereign control. But if we lose our embodied relational selves, recognition of which should make us less all-knowing and less harsh, we lose dialogue, we lose a sense of what is appropriate to creatures such as ourselves. We also lose the living incarnational realities of human life lived in common with others. We lose concrete history. As Pope Benedict XVI argues, without embodied history, he tells us, political theory becomes an entirely Gnostic enterprise, all words, no flesh, all spirit, no body. So to fight this tendency, Charles Taylor calls it excarnation, requires that certain possibilities have not been smashed altogether. And here I would say, there is reason to be hopeful, not optimistic, which would be ridiculous, because that's a conviction everything will turn out, but hopeful. And I'm going to look, begin by looking in a very unlikely place. Um, I would ask you to consider, and some of you no doubt have read this classic work, the horrific world limed by Primo Levi in his classic survival in Auschwitz. Now it is impossible to imagine a world more cruelly designed to defeat the human person than the demonic social experiment known as the death camp. Now, Levy alerts us yet again 
to the fact that the camps flowed directly from a process of narrow, narrow ratiocination, a kind of terrible narrow rationalism. You had a kind of syllogism that gets played out to the bitter end. You know, you assume certain lives are unworthy of life and go down through your lo argument, your logic, and that means, perforce, they should be eliminated. Now, if indeed, then, there are lives unworthy of life, it follows that lives worthy of life uh, should destroy the unworthy because, again, they've already been defined out of the human universe in any case. History, in a sense, has already passed a death sentence against them. This is the argument Hannah Arendt makes in her classic work on totalitarianism, when she talks about the elimination of the Jews by the Nazis, the elimination of whole categories of people, the bourgeoisie, the kulaks uh, in the Soviet Union, that somehow inexorable laws of history are at work that guarantee that these people are going to disappear. So in a sense, we're just doing the work of history in aiding and abetting this process. So. Levy, being one of those categories, uh, slated to disappear, uh, an Italian Jew, characterizes life in the camp as a journey toward nothingness. But then he says something quite remarkable. These are his words. Yet no world of perfect unhappiness can exist. There is a limit on every joy and on every grief. And then he goes on to describe how human beings in the camp are reduced to phantoms in a sense that their embodied selves are undermined and destroyed. They're starved. They're beaten. They become sort of wraith-like. It's a demolition of man, according to Levy. Your life is reduced to the lowest level. So first he tells us they annihilate you as a person before they kill you. It isn't enough just to kill you. They must kill the notion of the moral person first, kill the human spirit first, and he reminds us of how fragile we are. And yet he goes on to say, the conviction that life has a purpose is rooted in every fiber of man. And for some inmates of the camps, surviving what he calls the insane dream of grandeur of their masters is what kept them going. Now, he keeps his own sense of purpose alive, and again, you might think about that with reference to the lecture we heard by Professor uh, Jenkins about uh, the residual, the sort of residue of Christianity that continues to permeate European culture. He keeps this alive by recalling to himself the canto of Ulysses from Dante's Divine Comedy, keeps rehearsing that in his own mind to remind himself that there was beauty and form and sense in the world and that there might be again. So he concludes this haunting memoir of the 20th century in this way. No human experience is without meaning or unworthy of analysis. He goes on to tell us in the camp, thousands of human beings who differed in just about every way people can differ, save for the sort of generic category they were placed in, were thrown into a vast social experiment. And what does he learn from all this? He learns that human beings are not fundamentally brutal at base. They are not. It is indeed far more complicated. Many social habits, he tells us, can be silenced and can be quashed, but they cannot be destroyed utterly. They cannot be destroyed utterly. So if he can redeem this much from the demonic horrors of the death camps, surely it seems to me we can find resources to draw upon as we look to common sense and decency and dignity, to our sense of shame, our capacity for joy, our ability to recognize when our dignity is affronted deep down, our ability to love and not just to use others. Now, selves that don't fashion themselves as sovereign may have readier access to all of this precisely because they find intimations and realizations of such a self all around us. One sees beauty and sadness and hope and mystery. There are truths to be found and discerned, and that's part of the very fabric of the universe. <laughs> 
Now, several other writers come to mind. I'm not going to do expansive discussions of these, but I just wanted to put some names out for you to consider as those who, again, offer up these sort of rich views of some alternative to self-sovereignty or how one might tame self-sovereignty. Um, one is the great poet, Nobel laureate, Szesla Milos, Polish uh, poet, um, now uh, gone. And the other is the American novelist, Marilyn Robinson. I think each, and I'm sure that some of you have read her, uh, each understands the persons are unique and unrepeatable, that they cannot simply be replaced by some generic new recruit. Each understands that pure thought is not greater than love. Now, Milos is also the author of one of the great books uh, about the nature of the totalitarian experiment called The Captive Mind. This is a great work that was derided by many critics when it first came out in the early 1950s. It was attacked by those who were still enchanted uh, by the world historical project of Marxism. In fact, Amiwosh told me over the course of a dinner conversation that he had been informed by a member of his tenure review committee at the University of California, Berkeley, that they gave him tenure in spite of the fact he'd written that book. Now, if we take a look at the captive mind, we enter a world of incarnationality. We leave behind a world of lifeless ratiocination. And here I have in mind his determination to be fleshly and concrete and particular. That is, an incarnational text is a world of concrete presences. It derives from an impulse to make real that which is symbolized or represented. The writer aims neither for a pure realm nor an ideal form, but a way to express reverence for that which simply is. Most importantly, the flesh and blood human being, the human beings all around us. And I think, for example, of my favorite passage from The Captive Mind that I want to share with you. In this passage, Miros describes walking through a train station in Ukraine in the desperately disordered time at the beginning of World War II. And he finds himself caught up short by the following scene. And this is how he describes it. It's one paragraph. A peasant family, husband and wife and two children, had settled down by the wall. They were sitting on baskets and bundles. The wife was feeding, feeding the younger child. The husband, who had a dark, wrinkled face and a black, drooping mustache, was pouring tea out of a kettle into the cup for the older boy. They were whispering to each other in Polish. I gazed at them until I felt moved to the point of tears. What had stopped my steps so suddenly and touched me so profoundly was their difference. This was a human group, an island in the crowd that lacked something proper to humble ordinary human life. The gesture of a hand pouring tea, the careful, delicate handing of the cup to the child, the worried words, I guess, from the movement of their lips, their privacy in the midst of that crowd, that is what moved me. For a moment, I understood something that quickly slipped from my grasp. That's the end of the quote. Now, perhaps one might suggest, using Miwosh's own work, what he had grasped and that slipped away was something about the fragility and the miracle of the quotidian, of the everyday that we often take for granted. And yet here it is highlighted and a scene where it cannot be taken for granted. So he's rightly celebrated for capturing such moments in his poetry. And his poems, he tells us, are all encounters with the peculiar circumstances of time and space. So that portrait of the forlorn bit of humanity huddled, huddled together, uprooted, yet making and pouring tea, that says something about the quotidian. For Miwosh, the touchstone for 20th century politics, and he is contrasting that moment to those who, in fact, created the disorder that put that family in that place at that time, the terrible upheavals and the murders and so forth. 20th century politics, he tells us, what was the whole touch terror and the immediacy of stark physical pain? And physical pain is a, and, and, the, and fear 
These are phenomena that self-enclose us. They cut us off from others. They undermine our sociality. Uh, Hannah Arendt talks about the dynamic internal to totalitarian societies where, in fact, as a result of fear and suspicion, terror, the worry that there may, may even be in your own home an informer who will turn you over to, uh, the, uh, to the Gestapo or to the secret police in the Soviet Union. Um, and in fact, this, in the Soviet Union, they made a hero of a young informer who informed on his parents and got them sent to a gulag. And there was a statue of this young man in Gorky Park in Moscow for many years. So what happens? What does this do, this terrible fear? Well, you, you know immediately what it does. It, it, it makes us withdraw from others. We're fearful. We draw into ourselves. It undermines the basis of trust. And finally, that even extends to one's own friends and family. Trust gets eroded. And then you have a situation where the totalitarian masters then achieve a kind of deformed solidarity by enfolding everybody into what she calls the iron band of tyranny. Because all the institutions of civil society have been destroyed. Uh, the institutions that rely on social trust have been undermined. And that enables the masters, if you will, to achieve the kind of control they want. So Miwosh puts on display the impoverished, one-dimensional, flattened out view of human beings that a totalizing ideology of politics and self-sovereignty feeds on and requires. And he indicts what he calls the vulgarized knowledge that voices birth to, in his words, the young cannibals who, in the name of inflexible principles, butchered the population of Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge, and who had graduated from the Sorbonne and were simply trying to implement the philosophical ideas they had learned. Now, let's turn to Marilyn Robinson briefly. In her award-winning novel, Gilead, uh, she opens up a world of simple and complex beauty and often unremarked goodness. Any human face is a claim on you. Her protagonist, who's this dying pastor, as many of you know, named John Ames, writes, because you can't help but understand the singularity of it the courage and loneliness of it. And in her incarnational writing, Robinson highlights what she calls the body blessed and broken in Christian theology and in everyday life. So Pastor Ames talks about the gift of physical particularity and how blessing and sacrament are mediated through it. There is a splendor, she tells us, revealed in a child's face. Robinson's protagonist also reminds us that the great Hebrew prophets of scripture chastised and loved a concrete people. Something I think too many moderns who don the mantle of prophecy seem to abandon as they appear to despise those they criticize and the country that is their home. Now we also have theologians to turn to, those who insist on the concrete living realities of communities and the relational dimension to all human propensities and projects. Let me mention just one. A theologian named Alistair McFadden in a book called Bound to Sin, where he alerts us to the deeply distorting, distorted, and damaging relationship that results when some human beings are systematically dominated over and mastered by others. Um, he offers what he calls a relational ecology and insists that every human being enters the world under a sort of burden of history. We can't escape it. And that history teaches us to beware of highly optimistic assessments of the possibilities of pure reason. Now even, interestingly enough, the architects of Nazi genocide found it difficult to kill face to face. You probably know that. Or to witness such killing or to view the aftermath of it. One reason they generated the whole diabolical machine, machinery of death in the camps, this very abstract uh, sort of movement of peoples through the train, then the selection process, and then gassing, is because the experience on the Eastern Front with the Einsatzgruppen who were shooting large numbers of people, and again sort of face to face, was so damaging to the German soldiers. They were too weak to take it. 
So you had to invent this other way to deal with it. So in eliminating their plans for mass murder, they required a distance that eliminated that in-between, that, that space um, in between myself and the other. So you have this sort of very narrow, deformed rationalism tethered to boundless will that generated this nightmare that we know all too much about. There's more, but let me, in the interest of time, move to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the anti-Nazi theologian, who reminds us throughout his work that bodiliness and human life belong inseparably together, he tells us, and this has very far-reaching consequences for our understanding of every aspect of human life. For, he tells us, we can use our bodies and those of others, well or ill. Now, for Bonhoeffer, the right to live is, he tells us, of the very essence. And even a life that we think of as the most wretched life is worth living before God. Clearly here he has in mind the Nazi extermination program of, of, of people with disabilities. What should ongoingly amaze us is the fact that, again, many of the lives that we imagine are terrible are in fact not that people find purpose and even joy in the midst of extraordinary difficulty. That's not all they find, but they also find that more frequently, perhaps, than we all realize. And then he tells us, freedom is not a quality of man. It is not a possession or an object or a form of existence, but a relationship. In truth, freedom is a relationship between persons. Being free means being for the other because the other has bound me to him. In relationship with the other, I am free. Now these, of course, are strong words that bespeak this incarnational reality. Human life is always lived in concrete communities, not in some nowhere land up here someplace. Um, so even as God, for Bonhoeffer, certainly for Augustine, the Trinitarian God uh, is dialogic, gives of himself, you know, the transcendent breaks into the imminent and so forth, we are called, uh, in a sense, to be likewise, to recognize our limited and mortal lives and yet to aspire to that which lies beyond this world. That is, for Bonhoeffer, the penultimate and ultimate are in a relationship an ongoing complex relationship, one with the other. So a question that we have to think about is, can these recognitions be ongoingly rekindled? What resources do we have that remain present to us in our culture that offer possibilities of renewal? Uh, it seems to me we're never in a zero-sum game in which this life of ours, um, if I give something, uh, it's taken away from me absolutely. It's appropriated by someone else. Um, and I lose it. And we're never in that kind of game. Uh, that, it, that kind of notion that if I give, I'm simply denuded. I get nothing in return unless I have a strict contract that sets the terms of what I get in return. That sort of world seems to me more like Sartre's hell is other people. You know, it's a, it's a desolate, it's a dead, and it's a lonely world. That sort of world is not the world of people who embrace the ordinary and the everyday, sort of lives lived in common. Um, it is a world of people who despise that. Now, Augustine's fear was that as we give up on God's sovereignty, other forms of human sovereignty and not of the chastened or limited sort would drive to become superordinate and destructive without this sort of chastening influence. And he was keenly aware of the fact that any human institution can be turned into an, an idolatry, whether of family or state or anything else. And the altar, it seems to me, or one altar at which we worship nowadays, is in fact this notion some notion of a sovereign self, whose key terms are control, doing your own thing, choice is a kind of willfulness, 
rather than as the sometimes tragic wane of options where there is no knockdown, good or bad, on either side, where there is moral ambiguity. The Augustinian pilgrim is one who can challenge the idolatries of his and her age without opting out by fleeing into a realm that is at least theoretically removed from a sort of hurly-burly of social and political life. Not possible, not possible. Now I want to turn to some, oh yes, I better do that, <laughs> to some concluding thoughts from Camus. Uh, I picked him in part because he's a thinker who lived through and was defined by something we should be proud of, our culture of self-criticism that's so characteristic of the West. He was an unbeliever, not an atheist. In fact, he hated to be called an atheist. Uh, unbeliever is not one who is absolutely certain that there is no God, and he lived his whole life in an ongoing dialogue with Christians. He understood our indebtedness to those who had gone before, who had crafted the possibilities of such a culture, including the great Christian thinkers and theologians, a culture for Europe and the West at her best, uh, exploring a world of moral relativism and nihilism, Camus indicts philosophies that are used as goads and alibis for abstract mass murder. He indicts those who take refuge in ideologies and who, in his time, erect slave camps, he tells us, under the flag of freedom. That was the big issue in his day, totalitarianism. That was the big threat. So one thing we need to consider is what, what, are, what are the threats now? What are the forces at work? How do we respond? What is there to help us respond? And again, I'm suggesting that one way we can name tendencies, and this is not, again, some people coming at us. This is within the frame of our own culture, our own handiwork, you know, where again, the self grows sort of untethered and becomes this strong sovereign self that I've been criticizing. Here's what Camus says in his great essay, The Rebel. If we believe in nothing, if nothing has any meaning and we can affirm no values whatsoever, then everything is possible and nothing has an importance. There is no pro or con. The murderer is neither right nor wrong. We are free to stoke the crematory fires or to devote ourselves to the care of lepers. Since nothing is either true or false, good or bad, our guiding principle will be to demonstrate that we are the most efficient, in other words, the strongest, and that is the measure of our success. So here Camus sketches a world of the sort of will to power triumphant, and how does he tell the story of this triumph? It is nothing less, he says, than the history of European pride in rebelling against a world that is cruel or murderous or systematically unjust, he says the authentic rebel, rebelling against such a world, must observe limits. He or she must acknowledge the existence of a borderline, limits that one respects and wishes to preserve. In other words, that one's actions, even in opposition to that which is unlimited, cannot themselves be unlimited. One observes limits, limits in fighting those who espouse limitlessness, including the limited right, if you will, to kill. When a person rebels, Camus tells us, he identifies himself, she identifies herself with others rather than repudiating them utterly. The rebel eschews resentment, rejects a corrosive envy of what he or she does not have. The authentic rebel wishes to defend what he and she in fact is, namely a human being, a person, a moral person. And in rebellion, one finds not isolation, but authentic human solidarity. So strong is his claim in this regard that anyone, he says, who claims the right to destroy this solidarity loses the right to be called a rebel in Camus' understanding, and becomes instead acquiescent in murder. I rebel, therefore we exist. 
Now the alternative is unlimited freedom, the negation of others, the suppression of pity, and he says the totalitarian society is a story of unbridled freedom to kill. So Augustine and Camus would come together in an answer to what happens to people in his time and place who lived or thought they could live without grace and without justice. And nihilism, if you will, supplied the answer, kind of frenzied will to power triumphed. And finally, Camus insists, for all of us, everywhere, in any time and place, one must insist on the fact that there is a human nature, there is something in us that resists attempts to turn us simply into the rubble of historic forces. A few more quotes. This is still from his book, The Rebel. Absolute revolution presupposes the absolute malleability of human nature and its possible reduction to the condition of a historical force. But rebellion is a refusal to be treated as an object and to be reduced to simple historical terms. It is the affirmation of something common to all persons which eludes the world of power. Now he reminds us that the fruit of Western culture then, if we are to think of those fruits, that we must remember both Jerusalem and Athens, belief and unbelief, skepticism and faith, and for Camus, the beauty of this world and our ability to respond to it is one possible source for regeneration of our culture, which recalls, as he puts it, the common dignity of man and the world he lives in, and which we must now define in the face of a world that insults it. That's the end of the quote. Now, in his novel, The, the Plague, some of you surely have read it. Camus' narrator, Dr. Ryu, bears witness, in Camus' language, the, the, the narr narrator's language, bears witness to the sufferings of innocent people laid low by the terror of the plague. And after the plague is gone, what happens? What do you see? You see social life returning. People come out of their homes. They're not fearful anymore. They greet one another in open plazas. They laugh and they drink and they eat together. And seeing this scene of human renewal and sociality and happiness, Dr. Ryu warns us that we must never be complacent, must never take all of that for granted. And these are the final words in, in the novel. Ryu knew that the tale he had to tell would not be one of final victory. It could only be the record of what had had to be done and what assuredly would have to be done again in the never-ending fight against terror and its relentless onslaughts, despite their personal afflictions by all who, unable to be saints, but refusing to bow down to pestilences, strive their utmost to be healers. And indeed, as he listened to the cries of joy rising from the town, Ryu remembered that such joy is always imperiled. He knew what those jubilant crowds did not acknowledge but could have learned from books, that the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for good. It can lie dormant for years and years in furniture and linen chests. It bides its time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and bookshelves, and perhaps one day, the day would come when for the bane and enlightening of men, it would rise up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. I take this to be his meditation on, again, evil, that it never goes away, it is an ever-present possibility, and one day it will, in fact, manifest itself again, and one must be aware of those possibilities. Well, selves that are less than sovereign, I think, can appreciate this moral allegory and find ways to live with this kind of recognition without becoming hopeless and despairing. It's far easier to pretend that you're fully sovereign and in control, but then you're living in a kind of dream world that's going to fade or it's going to crash to bits as all dreams of incandescent glory can and must. Sovereign selves immersed in a world Selves, not sovereign selves, selves, responsible selves, immersed in a world with and among their fellow human beings, 
affirm and respect and find joy in life's everydayness and its simple joys and pleasures. So love may not be all we need, but without it, we are just husks. We are willful spirits rushing onward into the abyss. Now, I thought I would end there, and maybe you wish that I had had, had uh, stayed with that, that assumption, but there's one other thing I want to, to say to you before I stop. Um, something happened to me as I finished the book, and uh, it came to me that it wasn't quite finished yet. And then I remembered something that I had written many years earlier. Um, I'd nearly forgotten about it. And I went searching for it and found it. It's very, very brief. And it, it's apropos everything we've been talking about. Um, and I want to uh, conclude by reading this, if you'll bear with me for a few more minutes. It's a story of empty pockets. During a recent trip, uh, written in 1992, during a recent trip to Rome, I enjoyed an evening in the company of a group that included a young Jesuit who had spent a year in El Salvador and was due to return there soon. At one point over the course of the evening's discussion, Father Michael described the time he had spent at one of the L'Arche communities founded by Jean Vanier. L'Arche began in 1964 when Jean Vanier bought a home in rural France and invited two adults with mental retardation to live there with him. Some 60 L'Arche communities now exist worldwide. The guiding spirit behind L'Arche differs dramatically from the therapeutic part, uh, paternalism that often structures relationships between the normal and the mentally handicapped. L'Arche is a community dedicated to the unlikely proposition that the more able should not do things for, in this paternalistic way, the less able, but should live with them in covenant. Writes Vanier, handicapped people are often teachers of the strong. With their qualities of heart, their lives of faith and love, they offer testimony to the truth that a place for meeting with God is in our vulnerability and our weakness. Now, I thought of Vanier's words as I listened to Father Michael tell a story of empty pockets. At L'Arche, when he was in community there, he helped to dress and to clean a profoundly handicapped young man. And one day it struck him, just hit him, that this young man went out into, out of the, his room and into the world and through his life every single day with pockets that were completely empty. No money, no ID card, no driver's license, nothing. Empty pockets. Father Michael thought of how odd this was. And one of us, I'm not sure if it was me, but it could well have been, um, when you're thinking of empty pockets, said no keys. You know, think of how many keys we need to unlock things. Our offices, our homes, our automobiles. The real problem, Father Michael decided, was not with his handicapped brother, but as he put it, with me and my ideas of him and what I thought he felt. As Father Michael said these words, he put his hand over his heart. And I remarked on how the heart's understanding of humanity is often more generous and expansive than definitions that rely on our measures of intelligence or productive capability. And this led those at the table to begin to talk back in 1992 of the turn to this growing eugenics enthusiasm with its technocratization of birth and its tacit conviction that the world would be better off if they, the handicapped with their empty pockets, were no longer to appear among us. It is important to note that the urge to eliminate the handicapped through technology is a view often born of misplaced compassion. But this compassion turns perverse because it is a free-floating, untethered sentimentalization, devoid of concrete experience or engagement with those with the empty pockets. As I was driven back to my room near the Santa Maria Maggiore on that becalmed, warm Roman night, I felt a spreading sorrow, for I am convinced 
that are reigning metaphors of success and productivity of what counts as definitory of the human will more and more leave our fellow human beings with their empty pockets in the shadows eclipsed outside the circle of concern. And here the unbearable lightness of a certain sort of triumphalist and narrow secularism, and I say I know not what else to call it, there may be a better term, can be seen as exacting a terrific toll in its heady leaps always forward, always upward, pockets full of keys, inexorably extending and deepening not our awe and humility, but our drive for sovereign control. And I remembered one of Vanier's warnings. One of the dangers in our world is wanting to do big heroic things. We are called to do little things lovingly, to work to create community. And you don't need full pockets to be a citizen of that polity. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Sure, sure. We have time for uh, questions and conversation with Professor Elstang, so if you would step to the microphone and uh, please tell us who you are as well. I'm, I'm sorry I overstayed my welcome here by going on too long perhaps, but uh, we'll get some questions on the table. Despite the fact you've eaten and you're tired, you now have to think of a question. <laughs> I know there's someone with a question. I, I would Thank like you. it if actually, if are you? Well, you're not a student. I'll let you ask a question. Oh, is anyway. it just for students? Uh, well, go ahead. Oh. But I, I want to oh, encourage sorry. students to ask questions. No, I, let me sit down. Let them let them come up. All right. I, I would especially like students to ask questions because I think often students get sort of lost in the shuffle in these things and it would be nice to get a question or two from a student. Um, don't be don't be intimidated. Um, yay. All right. Good for you. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Emma and I had a question about like you know you address the idea of um, uh, selective abortion. Yes. How would you take care of the idea that people use people use the argument that they're doing it for the person's own good? Like when yeah. it comes to the severe medical conditions. Yeah. 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 Well, um, Emma, it seems to me that, in fact, um, if you'll recall during my talk where I uh, was citing Bonifer. Uh, his his, his uh, argument that there are many lives that we we think are wretched lives and unworthy of of, of living, and yet uh, in fact uh, many of those lives and these are we often think of this abstractly because we never deal with such persons for the most part. Um, their lives are in fact do do have meaning and purpose, um, and and even joy on some level. As I said, that's not all that's there, but that may well be there. Um, so it's, it's a little odd, don't you think, to say, well, we'll have the selective abortion because if the person were actually to be born, they'd be really miserable. So in a way, you kind of abstractly eliminate a person before birth because of your misplaced or deformed sense of compassion. Better, better that they never appear among us, as I said. Um, that again strikes me as, um, first of all, it's an example of the kind of abstracted uh, view of the world and argument that I was criticizing more generally. But I think it also suggests, does it not, we talk a lot about the other these days, it suggests deep down a real fear of the other, of the fact that, that there are human beings who appear in the world in bodies um, with minds that we don't fully understand, um, that frighten us on some level, because they suggest fragility. Uh, they suggest that people can be infirm, or perhaps says too much to us about what we one day might be. Um, they may even, on some level, um, 
give us pause about the purposes and value of you know, our own capacity to engage in certain kinds of mental operations because if such persons in fact can display a range of human traits and qualities, then if you've privileged you know, a certain sort of thinking, you know, the thinking apparatus abstractly construed is if our bodies are there just to carry our brains around, you know, then, then that can, it, that can call, it can call that into question as well. Um, so I think there's a deep-rooted sort of fear involved often as well. Um, at any rate, if you're having a conversation with someone about this, I would begin to raise those kinds of, those kinds of questions um, and see if, if the conversation goes anywhere. Right, thank you. You bet, Emma. Uh, any, other, any other students? There's got to be another student who has a question. As you can see, it, the person, she's going back alive. <laughs> um, so it's not too dangerous. Here we go. Thank you for coming forward. Um, I'm Diane. Hi, Diane. And I wanted to ask a question. Sure. Um, coming from a different perspective, like, what would you say to someone who has a mental handicap yes. and who senses that? Senses that condescension? Right. And yeah. what would you say to them if, um, like, express to them their value, but not, yeah. um, not in, like, the negative way of, like, yeah. their value to us, but their genuine Their intrinsic value. worth. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That's okay. a hard question for okay. me personally. Um, yeah, so. yeah. Well, it's, you, you heard the question, I think, that, ha you know, uh, sort of affirm the intrinsic worth, not just, you're kind of interesting for me to think about, but, you know, you're, you're a, a full human being um, whom I recognize as such. And your question has to do with how to impart that, mm -hmm. how, to, how to do that. And, well, yeah. pardon? And also how yeah. they could actively... Um, give a positive impact towards the conversation, like yeah. how their voice could be heard. In yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Well, as you know, that, that becomes difficult because it depends on the degree of impairment right. and so forth. Um, but certainly if we take the example of Down syndrome people, um, as you know, most of them are fully capable of entering into a conversation. They're also fully capable of appreciating that this society at this time would prefer that they didn't exist. Yeah. I mean, they understand that, and uh, and and in fact have given vo voice themselves to that recognition um, that you know there are fewer and fewer of them, and so forth, because they're a form of life that we seek to eliminate. Um, there are others who cannot speak for themselves, and there, um, I ha I, one has to give voice to their full humanity. And I think that can be done in a way that isn't simply paternalistic or isn't self-serving to show how you know, enlightened you are and so on and so forth. Um, but it has to be with a certain kind of humility. And I think it's very difficult to find ways to do that in, uh, what shall I call them, purely secular forms of thought. I, I don't know, Jose Casanova may, crit may go after me for that, but I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of forms of thought that don't, acknowledge, don't have any transcendent reference point, where I think they have great difficulty, great difficulty, acknowledging the worth of such persons. Um, you don't find these you know, people with mental disabilities in the picture at all. The social contract people, the great social contractarians, had a really difficult time with this. You know, what do you do with the, the idiots and the imbeciles, you know? Children can't be fully members of the poly until they grow up. But there are some who are never going to be fully adults in the normal sense. What do we do with them? And again, that becomes a problem, it seems to me, within a certain framework, a problem that we have to try to solve. And I think it's that view. It's a problem we've got to solve, rather than a reality of this world that we recognize, and how, again, do we affirm uh, rather than destroy? How do we help you know, rather than harm? Uh, and there, in giving voice, I would say, to repeat myself, it has to be done with a certain, again, a certain humility um, and a certain uh, 
and we have to be capable of ourselves uh, thinking about what makes us human. And there, I think the resources are, um, we will find in, our, in Christianity, uh, in the Jewish tradition. I don't know Islam well enough, save its teachings on and war and peace issues, to know if you can find it in Islam. I'm sure that there are variants in Islam where you can find this worth uh, affirmed. I, I'm quite sure that it's got to be there. Um, and it's harder, much harder to find uh, outside the framework of um, views of the world forged in and through these understandings. Very hard to find. Um, any other student who wants to make the trek, the long walk to the microphone? I have made the Great. long walk. Yay! Right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Paul Baumgartner. Thank you for coming tonight. You bet. Um, I feel that at least part of our institutionalized concept of secularism can be traced back at least partially to our modern concept of political rights, a freedom mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. a liberty of. How would you reevaluate from a legalistic yeah. perspective what yeah. privileges we have and what rights yeah. we have? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. And I think there, one of the things one would want to do would be to um, look at the, the origin of our understanding of, of rights of human beings as bearers of rights, uh, how that was tied to a certain anthropology, understanding of the human person, um, as a person with dignity, um, how we affirm that through um, creating a system of immunities, if you will, rights as immunities. This is what organized power cannot do to you. The state cannot do this to you because you are a person, you're a child of God, it cannot arbitrarily imprison you, it cannot uh, come and grab you and, and kill you summarily. There are things it cannot do. So rights originally were set up in this, in this particular way, not as, not as a series of entitlements, but as a series of immunities. So you would want to look at that, um, how that was tied to an understanding of the human person that was necessarily nested within a theological framework, and then how rights over time got again disconnected, detethered from these understandings of the self, uh, got more and more tied to certain notions of entitlement that then tended to flow from a different construal of the self. Uh, some political theorists have called it possessive individualism, but it's more that notion I was criticizing about strong sovereign selves. We are most ourselves when we control and possess things. Um, and rights got tied to that. It never lost the connection, mind you. That's why rights is, are so complicated. Um, and I, I don't think one can just be against rights. It's a very complicated thing. And there are many people in the world today, and indeed I've met some of them, for whom rights is, is it may not be much, but it's, it's the strongest political claim they can make against how they're being treated, or, or abused, I should say maltreated. Um, so it's dangerous simply to, to trash rights entirely. But I think that's the way I would start to, to parse it and to take a look at it. And, and people are doing that. You know, there's work along those lines being done. How do we recuperate, you know, this richer understanding of, of rights and the way it's tied to, sorry, I keep pumping this and making terrible noises. The videotape will have lots of strange sounds on it. Um, and how it was tied again to this framework that we've lost. Yeah. You know, so is there any way to restore some of that framework and to renew this richer notion of rights? And I, I, think it's a, I think it's a real challenge. And don't take me to be saying I'm against all entitlements, but, but certainly in my 1995 book, Democracy on Trial, I criticized the translation of wants into rights. You know, that which I want suddenly becomes something I have a right to. And we don't know how to draw limits to that process. So it's not surprising, you know, there's no outer limit. So it's not surprising that the line keeps stretching about what is a right because people's wants know no limit in principle. Um, and that I think, I'm exaggerating for effect here, but I think that's the dynamic that's been in play for some decades now. So does that help? Does that make, does. help you make, okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, 
I remember at some point during the talk, yes. you said something about how if there are no limits, yes. then there is ultimate almost destruction. I yeah. think you mentioned something about destroyers. Yes, and, I did. I did say that. But later on, I think you also said something that amounted to that humans at their base are not brutal. That's right. How do you reconcile yeah. those two ideas? Yeah, yeah. Well, again, thank you. That's that's very astute of you to have to have picked that up. Uh, the the um, the the human beings at base are not brutal. Was the quote from Primo Levi, if you recall uh, his his memoir of uh, of Auschwitz, and I was citing that to show how remarkable it was. As someone who w lived managed to live um, through that terrible experience, could nevertheless come to that conclusion. Um, so we've got that standing there. And then the notion that you know, we, we become destroyers if we recognize no limit. And I think, it, I think the two are quite compatible. That is to say, we do become destroyers. Certainly the architects of the camps, the enforcers of the camps were destroyers. And yet one of the things that Primo Levi learns there, um, in part because of his experience with uh, fellow prisoners, and in part because of some flickers of humanity, he saw even in those who were running the camps uh, here and there, you know, something that wasn't totally sort of absorbed in the, the Nazi project, if you will, that that's how he can come to that conclusion. I mean, he also warns us that this, this is fragile. And certainly at times, the brutal tendencies and the destructive tendencies overtake people. And yet what he suggests is we should not give up uh, altogether, we should not despair altogether because at base, you know, people are never just by definition brutal. It's, it's, it, it, that's not true. Uh, that it takes quite a lot, actually, to enroll people in such projects, um, to control them and to define them and to manipulate them. Some are rushed to it with enthusiasm, but most don't. Um, they're caught up in it. Um, and uh, some, at least, have the capacity for shame uh, in the aftermath. Some don't, but there are plenty who do. Okay. Thank you. Over here? Oh, my, and over here. Good. Yeah. I'm sorry, you were there first, weren't you? And I was looking at, all right, there you go. Sorry, I had my head turned just this way. Thank you, ma'am, for coming here. My name is Daniel Severa. Sure. Um, very good uh, topic tonight. Thank One you. thing that I have a question about in terms sure. of human value. Uh, you sure. mentioned um, how human value had been kind of diminished in terms of uh, when uh, human disability was taken into account through eugenics and so forth and yeah. how that extended into the Nazi Germany exterminations yeah. and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of interested in about in a different sort of kind of dehumanization you've, you've identified, how it's kind of made a resurgence in a different kind of way. That's uh -huh. um, but, um, I, Maybe you might have heard of a, of a, of a case, I guess, Gallaudet University, which I believe is the largest university uh, for the, uh, deaf students uh, in Washington, as I understand it. And um, there had been a case, apparently, where the university president had worked with uh, cochlear implant companies to try to improve yes, hearing. Yes, and yes. The stu some student responses were, this is a, an assault on I their know. very identity. I know. And, I know. and I think a problem that yeah. that presents itself is that yeah. you're, we're no longer able to make certain distinctions yeah, to the yeah. point now that I think the point you made earlier um, that we experiment with our natures at our own peril kind yeah. of is it's an assault on that very concept yeah. do you see yeah. that as a major Boy. problem as much as it is as, and, and if so how can we engage that in a way yeah. that doesn't yeah. make us sound like well we're we don't want to make the person feel terrible for yeah you know, yeah or, or that somehow we don't want uh, deaf people are inferior right. And so, do you know about this case? It's a famous school for the, for the deaf, the profoundly hard of hearing. And there's this uh, medical technique that's been developed called cochlear implants uh, that can be used to help the, those who can't hear to, to hear. Uh, it's, it's a pretty, um, it's, it's not so much physically painful as, as uh, mentally quite tormenting procedure. Because you can imagine if you're a child and you haven't you, you're, you're deaf, and then suddenly you're starting to hear sounds that it's just is profoundly disorienting. Um, and it takes a long time and, a, and a, an extraordinary amount of work and support for eventually for the child to be able to learn words and so forth. Um, parents of uh, children 
um, of deaf children are profoundly torn about this. Do you, do you want your child to be a hearing child? It's not very easy to be a person um, with profound hearing loss in this world. One of my grandmothers was deaf, so I, I know something about how difficult that can be. Um, and and uh, yet the process itself, you know, is uh, problematic for a number of reasons. Now, there are members of the deaf community uh, who, in fact, let's, let's leave aside the individual struggle of parents and so on to make decisions, who have turned deafness into uh, a kind of identity politics, a form of identity politics. You know, just as we have race and gender and sexual orientation as a kind of identity politics, ethnicity, well, this has become a form of identity politics. And, and there's a kind of purist um, drive in it. You know, we must maintain the purity of the deaf community, and that makes, there's very little flexibility in that. Uh, so that those who want these cochlear implants and think that parents should be the ones to decide about their children are often then um, well criticized, I mean, uh, assaulted. I mean, the, the attacks on them are quite severe. Um, so it seems to me that um, even as um, one's gender doesn't exhaust who one is, One's ethnicity does not. One's sexual orientation does not. One's deafness does not either. And to make that the totality of who one is, I think, is problematic, even if one can understand very well the historical reasons for it. So what I would see right now, I don't have a big solution to this issue, but for there to be, again, the possibility of, of some differences on, on where people come down on this, on this question. Um, I, it's, a, again, a very difficult one, but I, do, I really have reservations when it turns into a big ideological project and you draw the lines really tightly and, you know, you're going to exclude all of those who decide they want to go through the process of helping their child to, to, to be hearing. So does that help to clarify at all? I, it, the, my view obviously does not fit with the politics of the thing, because, you know, the politics is, has been very sort of confrontational. And I'm calling, I, I would call for a more, you know, open and dialogic process and more nuance, but that tends not to be the way politics works these days, as you probably know. Yes. Hi, thank you. My name is uh, sure. Stephen Marga. Hi, Stephen. Um, your talk was, um, amazingly uh, thoughtful. Thank but you. The question yeah. that stayed in my mind, especially sure. given the context, was um, you talked extensively on the necessity of returning our feet to terra firma, as yeah. you said it, and yeah. avoiding this um, extreme form of abstraction. Yeah. And I was wondering what practical um, tips you would have for people engaged in the life of the mind, and mm -hmm. perhaps even people thinking about the possibility of the life of the mm -hmm. mind, how one can correctly uh, and prudently walk the middle ground of yeah. keeping your feet on the ground while still um, practicing. Living, living the life of the mind? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, there's nothing like having a child to do that. Uh, the, uh, that's, that's a sh pretty sure and certain remedy. Um, the, and, I, and I think that, you know, I think that that, that, that I mean, uh, that's a serious point because uh, we know that there are so many in the academic world today. You know, we were talking about that at our table before I came up here uh, to give my remarks. Um, you know, sort of young, dual career couples uh, in the academy who, who, who never have children. Now, you know, don't walk out of here and say, you know, Professor L. Shane thinks everyone should be having children. I mean, that's not the point. The point is that they, they don't have kids, they don't have experience with children. Um, you know, people on college campuses, faculty who are there for years and years uh, live in an environment where you tend, on most campuses, uh, not all, you tend not to see babies, you don't see young children. Um, I mentioned that I see more dogs being, you know, pets being brought to professors' offices by the professor than children. And I have nothing against the dogs. I'm happy to see the dogs, you know. That's at least some, you know, sort of warm, furry 
thing, you know, <laughs> that needs to be fed and walked and so on. So that reminds you, you know. Um, so the dogs are good, but, um, but you, it, it's a strange world um, that where you don't, you get a kind of warped sense, or you can, of the human being and the human life cycle. There are certain categories of people that are just not present to you at all. Um, so I think, you know, engagement with uh, the f ways to have an engagement with, you know, the full range of humanity. Uh, don't be stuck entirely inside the enclave of the academy. That can do very strange things to you. Um, one of the uh, one of the uh, jokes that people often make is that, you know, academic politics is so vicious because the stakes are so low, you know, that, but, but yet they get, they get magnified beyond all recognition because you, you don't engage the world in any wider sense. Um, so that, that's certainly something that, that one can do, you know, is to, um, it doesn't require a big heroic stand. I mean, you just um, make sure that you recognize that as much as you may care about your colleagues in the university, it's not your family. Um, it doesn't exhaust all the ways to be in the world, decent ways to be in the world, and that it is important for you to engage, as I said, a full range of people and not just to stay within narrow academic circles. So I think that's one way to do it. And then I think also, uh, depending on the line of work you go into uh, in the academy, um, that you know you could do your best to try to avoid, you know, certain approaches that seem uh, utterly devoid of or even contemptuous of, you know, diverse forms of life. I mean, that's another possibility, depending on what you're up to. Clearly, if you're a mathematician, you know, it's 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 not the same as being a social philosopher. Um, and you would think social philosophers couldn't avoid uh, dealing with this nitty gritty, but many of them do, you know. They manage somehow. So, <laughs> anyway, does that, yes, does that help you. at all? Okay, good. Another, we have another question here. I'm Ann. Hi, Ann. Hi. Um, so, uh, the the gap that's created by this distinction of categories of people we associate yeah. with, um, particularly in the academy, seems exactly the problem and why there are philosophers that say our autonomy is the source of our worth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But how do you suggest that we engaged, engage those academics um, and motivate them practically yeah. to step outside of the academy yeah. and um, maybe not just with children, but there yeah. seems a special to be a special quality in um, the disabled mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that will kind of bring to life mm -hmm. uh, certain characteristics in us that are human that we don't yeah. see when we're yeah. upstairs in the classroom. Um, how do you suggest that we motivate that person who's perfectly content um, in the academy to step down for a moment and engage those people? Well, you've got a real challenge ahead of you. I mean, I think that, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I think that if you're, if you're, a, if you're an academic in, in a setting that rewards, where the incentive structure is built up in such a way that, um, you know, that the more hours one spends in one's office, the more one is, tends to be rewarded, um, given the academic structure. The incentives, to borrow from our economic friends, are often, uh, or it's really disincentives, you know, to, um, to live a richer human life um, that is um, filled with multiple sources of meaning and value. Uh, I think this has changed somewhat um, for the good, uh, but certainly uh, universities have not uniformly been family friendly in what they demand from faculty and, um, and what they expect, especially from junior faculty, uh, which is the age when if people are going to have children, they tend to have them, um, and the extraordinary burden that puts on on spouses and so forth. Um, and I think universities have become, again, not uniformly, but have become a little more flexible with that. Um, and um, again, have, have created ways uh, that they can recognize at least that people do have family responsibilities, and that doesn't mean that they're being less dedicated professors. 
Um, I, I had an experience when I was at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. I was on the department executive committee, which was the elected committee that made decisions about things. And at one point, there was this was sort of pre-tenure for a couple of faculty, and there was discussion about one of our uh, untenured male faculty members um, who um, his wife pretty much insisted, and he decided he would do what his wife insisted on, uh, that he be home um, two afternoons a week for when the children got home from school. Uh, she was a painter and she needed time in her studio and she'd only spend time in the studio in the afternoons, as it turns out, because she didn't have the money to rent it full time. Well, the, the, the word went out that, let me call him Tom, that wasn't his name. Um, well, we're a little worried about Tom. You know, we don't, we don't see him in his office um, all the time. And so there is this fretting going on about Tom. And I said, well, has he missed any classes? No. Does he keep his office hours? Yes. Um, is he working on getting his book finished? Yeah. So, you know, what's the problem? Well, the problem was many of them were so used to, you know, a, a regimen in which, you know, you, you were expected to be there uh, every day. That was, that was the assumption. Um, so there was the assumption that Tom couldn't be fulfilling his responsibilities and duties. So, you know, but I was able to intervene and then people were, well, yeah, that's right. And so on. So um, that assumption, I think, has changed. I'm not advocating that professors never show up, you know, uh, which seems to be what happens from time to time too, but, uh, but rather that there be some balance, uh, again, in, in how lives are, are, are lived and some recognition that people have lives outside, you know, their, their departments. Um, and then I, we prob I probably should, okay, last question. Okay. Thank you students for stepping forward. <laughs> Um, sorry if I, uh, if I uh, don't express this as, as, as what I'm trying to express, you, in which case will, it won't be a very valuable you question. You will do just but, fine. Um, I guess I'm the sort of person who whenever I hear um, topics like this spoken about, you know, I always feel burdened um, for whatever the particular group is that it, you know, it's addressed to in this case. Um, you know, particularly struck me um, about interacting with people who have either mental yeah. retardations yeah. or other yeah. handicaps or whatnot. And I recognize that any of these could, you know, singly be a pursuit that could encompass your entire life. Yes, it could. Um, yep. And obviously one can't devote oneself to all these different Ab absolutely. things. Um, absolutely. By the same token, we, we can't slough off not yeah. addressing a, a yeah. specific group of people because um, we feel, hey, this is somebody else's calling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, by yeah. the same token, um, it doesn't do any good for us to go out with this kind of patronizing mindset right. of I want to put in my time with this group of people so that I can feel better about, about myself, myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. or I can feel that I'm making my jolly good contribution yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but uh, based on, you know, the reality of the situation, a lot of times, you know, I'm not going to encounter people like that if I don't right. go actively right. seeking it right. out. Right. right. Um, so <laughs> what well, advice what, 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 do you what, have on, to, what on earth should you? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, first of all, I, you know, we should all, I think, be, feel burdened by certain things, but that does not mean, and I certainly was not stating, that all of you, therefore, should devote yourselves to, you know, a lifelong engagement of persons with disabilities. What I was trying to get across was, was to, uh, to, uh, to undermine, because of the concrete engagements other people have had and have shared with us, to undermine, you know, a view that makes such persons completely invisible to us, or even a threat to us. Or even something that we sh we is such a threat, or such a, or, or this misplaced sense of compassion. The world would be better off without them in it. And in fact, they would prefer not to be born, you know, um, because who would want to be in the world in that way? Um, to try to defeat those kinds of ideas, and that's certainly something you can do. You know, those are recognitions you can share without yourself engaging in this kind of work. Um, and, and in these sorts of tasks. Um, I think anything that, um, that helps to bring out of the shadows, you know, those that we get over there, you know, I don't want to deal with this, um, helps. So, you know, your voice, 
could make a huge difference just because of the recognition you have about this, whether you yourselves on a, you yourself on a personal level have had these engagements or not. And trust me, sooner or later you will. Um, I mean, one shouldn't limit this to uh, persons with profound disabilities. Uh, you know, sooner or later in your own family, you know, your, your parents will become infirm, likely, one or more. Um, there will be others known to you. And so whether through accidents or illness or aging, uh, we'll no longer sort of fit the profile, you know, of this strong sovereign self. So you, you will have some kind of engagement uh, that calls into question, you know, many of the assumptions that undergird our notion of the sort of perfect sovereign self. Um, so, so you shouldn't feel burdened in an overwhelming way. Um, but I do think that at least, again, sharing those kinds of recognitions is something that we, we can all do. Um, and, uh, you know, as we go about our, our chosen vocations, whatever they may be. So, well, thank you all very much. Thanks, students. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.